Welcome back to Retro Rebound. Today we get into a topic that I get so many questions about, and I think it's about time with a recent leak that we talk about the rise of digital games. Now, of course, we're all out here thinking about our physical games, right? I know this is a weird one to pull out, but it was the only one in front of me. We're always thinking about our physical games, and let's be honest, some people like the convenience of digital gaming. And I understand why. It's also given birth to the likes of Xbox Game Pass, and now it looks like PlayStation Game Pass. So you're wondering probably how those very services have gave birth to this conversation topic. Well, we're about to explain all of that. But first, if you're new here and you're looking for more retro-themed content, consider checking out everything else we have uploaded. Plenty to pick from. And thank you all so much for your support here as we near 10,000 subscribers here on Retro Rebound. With that, Let's talk about the rise of digital gaming. So I mentioned Xbox Game Pass, but now a leak has stated that sometime in spring next year, PlayStation will bring about their own Game Pass competitor. And one of the perks that has been reported for this PlayStation Game Pass is backwards compatibility with a library of PS1, PS2, PS3, and PSP classics. Now on paper, that sounds really exciting because we've been itching to get some back compat on PlayStation, right? Especially with the cell processor on the PS3. It felt like a foreign concept to hear that a PlayStation console of any kind outside of the three would ever run a PlayStation 3 video game. So for that alone, I'm very excited. But then some of that excitement wears off when you take one extra thought and you look at one other existing service, one we've talked about here on this channel, and how this can play out, and in a way how it's guaranteed to play out. And that's Nintendo Switch Online with its recent expansion pack. There's become, outside of Xbox, this monetization of back compat and really this monetization of nostalgia. And the latter, at least I can understand because you can get creative with that and do something like Final Fantasy VII Remake. Like, yeah, it's Final Fantasy VII, but if you actually play VII Remake, you know it's very different from what we saw with the original Final Fantasy VII. So at least in that department, there could be some new stuff discovered. But then you look at what Nintendo's doing with the expansion pack saying, hey, we're going to charge you a ton of money for a yearly subscription to have access to Nintendo 64 games and Sega Genesis games, as well as NES and SNES, that you just can't buy out the storefront. And instead of doing what they did with the virtual console, which was great, just pick a game, Game Boy, GameCube, what have you, buy it, download it, boom, it's right there. You don't have to be a part of the subscription service. We're now seeing PlayStation do what is reportedly a three-tier system. And in the third tier, you'll have access to that classic library, which tier three will also probably be the most expensive. Now, we don't know prices, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. But I think now is a great time to take a look at what digital gaming is becoming. And why this channel even exists is because of the rise of digital gaming. I think a lot of people are going to get real tired really fast of being nickel and dimed for things that already they have paid for and they just want access to on modern consoles. It's why I appreciate what Xbox is doing so much. And what really stinks is they've stopped their backwards compatible program, as we've also talked about on this channel with some big snubs that have been missed out on, that games that could have been back compat that never will see the light of day. But also FPS Boost, which has now been shut down, where they were able to give 60 frames per second to Xbox 360 games like Fable Anniversary, which I know we've referenced a lot of content here, but that's how much it's ramping up. We talked about Fable here on this channel too. So Xbox has created an ecosystem where being an old head, is actually a really fun thing to be because it's not just going back to these dated systems, but experiencing these old games in new ways. And it's all done with the same disc. I could throw in my copy of Fable Anniversary and it will play better, but they're not gonna charge me for it. And we're seeing companies have no issue saying, we're gonna charge you to play our old games. And you look at even something like PC where it's all in one library on Steam. I find it immensely frustrating. It eats at me. It really does. Because we should have access to the games that we paid for. And it shouldn't be a perk to be able to throw our disc in our console and play this old thing. And it certainly shouldn't be monetized to hell like it already is going to become. And this sucks because 
Xbox can't do anything to sort of set the example other than what they've already done because they said due to legal and technical limitations, there's no longer going to be any backwards compatible editions. So you go, okay, they're done. And now the ball is in PlayStation's court to respond and the way they're responding looks on paper more akin to what we're seeing with something like what Nintendo's doing. So the subscription services have brought a great boon with, I think, easy access and fantastic value and the ability to stream games to your phone, try them out before you even download them on your console. And of course, now people aren't left behind. You can have an Xbox One and try out a Series X exclusive game. And that means that you can know when you purchase a console, what games you also want to buy without having to do a little experimentation. I'm all for consumer power. So this is the great thing it's provided. But it's also now, as I said, provided a lot of nostalgic monetization. And it goes a little bit beyond that, of course, with games not really being permanent. Nothing is forever, of course, we know that. But we're seeing the likes of, say, Jump Force, a game that I thought was pretty safe to remain on digital store shelves for a while. Jump Force is being taken down and it's only available physically. Now, I know nothing of value was lost. <laughs> I get that. But we like Metal Gear, right? A lot of us like Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, and how these games need to hang around, right? And Konami had to take those down due to some type of expiring contract that was ongoing. They promised they're going to bring them back, but they made people aware that those games are not going to be available digitally for some time. And we don't know what goes on behind closed doors, what the legal ramifications are, and when it's worthwhile for these games to just be taken off of the storefront. Now look at some of my favorite series like Fallout. Fallout uses music from the 50s. When did the licenses for those games expire, right? There's so many questions on the digital front. And the reality is, unless Phil Spencer comes knocking on my door and says, hey, I'm gonna take sneakers right out of your hand, give it back. When you buy a game physically, the value, the perk sadly is this is forever. Unless you shut down the servers or some type of DRM thing is locking me out, you cannot take this away from me. And again, I'm kind of feeling bad that this is the only game I got in front of me. But you get the point that there is a novelty to going to the storefront, picking the game off the store shelf and saying, I want this. And of course, as games go up in price, just being able to take that physical thing home with you instead of just throwing your money into a digital void, there is something there. But now with games being torn off digital store shelves, it feels like everything is at one point going to expire. And again, I guess that's life, right? But when it comes to gaming... I feel like we're walking a dangerous path with just going all digital. And there's something marketable about the physical games that I don't think can be replaced. Like walking into the store, seeing the box art, having it all sit there on the shelves and going, hmm, little Jimmy might like that and picking it up. And also just getting the conversation going and having the market presence, being in the common consumer's eye and not just the hardcore who is just downloading stuff. I do think there's something there and I don't think physical games will ever go away entirely. But we're really getting to that point now where I look at a game like Scarlet Nexus, which sold poorly, and it sold especially poorly on Xbox, right? And I look at that and think to myself, that's a game that'll be expensive one day because it's only benefiting from its digital streams. And if it's not really successful out the gate where it's mainstream, especially with how supply chains are nowadays, you're not seeing companies overcompensate to print lots of discs, print lots of copies, because they already see people trending in one direction. So physical gaming is getting a little bit more expensive. And that too is frustrating to see because I think there's still a reason to be printing manuals, to be printing game discs. And I understand the environmental aspect of it all as well. As someone who is very pro environment, I think it's something we should consider with the amount of plastic we're printing that if we can find eco-friendly stuff to make this happen, I'm all for it. But of course, if it's at the sake of our planet, it's a whole conversation that is worth another video, I imagine. But I just find it really deeply upsetting that we're starting to pay for things that we already own. I think that's kind of inexcusable. And especially Nintendo, who showed us that they do have a system that works in virtual console, but it doesn't matter to them. And recurrent revenue is what matters. And I get it. I totally get why as a business it's appealing. But as a consumer, it feels like we're really taking a lot of steps back and just accepting it in the name of convenience. Convenience isn't just paying to have your old stuff there. It should be expected that the old stuff is there and that your generation of content that you paid for carries over. Just because it's not generating revenue 
for PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, doesn't mean that when you put your hard-earned money out there, that it shouldn't matter in a year because, well, you played it. You're done with it. Are you really going to play it? It's like, maybe I might. And if I am, I want to be able to play it on the new stuff. It's that simple. So fortunately, we've seen it carry over with the Xbox One and PS4 era. But when it comes to going deeper, Xbox is limited, although they have a great selection. And PlayStation and Nintendo look to monetize that. And especially with PlayStation, it's greatly frustrating because we're talking about a company that people have really wanted them to go all in on back and pat because they have a library ripe for the picking sly cooper jack and daxter ratchet and clank i mean we could sit here and honestly at one point we will as we get closer to the announcement of this of games that could be added to this service and to see that they've just kind of taken this route potentially is disappointing and even if they don't we still have one company who has and we still see a certain trend ongoing so ladies and gentlemen those are just some thoughts on the rise of digital gaming. How do you feel about all of this? Fire away. With that, take excellent care of yourselves, and I'll see you all in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.